So even though the Skavens only deployed an army of 1,700 and I killed 800 of them, for some reason I managed to capture 1,636. Look, I don't quite know how the statistics are working out on this one, but thank you, Tretch Craventel, nonetheless. Your slaves are going to be fantastic. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Spiff and Brit, and today we're playing Total War Warhammer 2. That's right, it's that fantastic grand strategy game where you can simulate in real time what it's like to throw hordes and hordes of rat monsters against hordes and hordes of massive lizard monsters. No other Total War game can quite encapsulate just how ridiculously fantastic the series is. But anyway, today, ladies and gentlemen, you might be wondering what we're doing in Total War Warhammer. Well, naturally, in true classic Spiffing Brit fashion, we're going to be playing the game, but in a way which, um, is a little bit different. You see, normal Total War Warhammer 2 would have you try and expand and conquer your foes, use diplomacy to cheese your way to success, but I'm not actually interested in conquering lands. No, no, no. I am simply interested in having a ridiculously large amount of money. I know. Money is fantastic. I mean, you can do practically everything with money. You want an empire? Just have a lot of money and accidentally buy India. It works every time. Anyone can do it. Anyway, today we're going to be playing a brand new campaign of Total War Warhammer 2. And naturally, because we're going to be putting a slight spin on it, we're going to be playing as the Dark Elves and we're going to be trying to generate as much money as possible with the fantastic assistance of slaves. So we're going to want a new game and this is where we have our first big important decision. You can play the Eye of the Vortex campaign, this is what actually Total War Warhammer 2 was meant to be about. However, you want to play Mortal Empires ladies and gentlemen and I'll explain why a bit later on. Basically, Mortal Empires makes the map bigger but by doing so they also make the regions on the map larger. Now we're going to be playing as the fantastic Malekith. He's basically an evil dark elf who is just trying to conquer and destroy most of the world. Initial challenge is apparently going to be a bit hard and spicy, but don't worry ladies and gentlemen, we should be able to pull it off. Now, this strategy which I'm going to be adopting does actually work at all difficulties, and there is a natural argument to be had for playing this game on legendary difficulty when you do this run. Now, what is the actual strategy for today? Well, it can be summarised into some rather simple steps. Number one, do battles. At the end of battles, choose to get slaves. Slaves generate money. Slaves generate unrest. Unrest spawns more battles. So whilst we are going to be gaining slaves naturally from just invading and attacking other AIs and all of that, our best way of actually making slaves is going to be inciting rebellions. We're going to basically be trying to find ways to cause rebellions to fire again and again and again because we can take the units which we kill from a rebellion and put them into our own provinces. Now the game does try to have a couple of ways to stop players from doing this as it is ridiculously overpowered, but naturally there's a workaround. Anyway, let's throw ourselves into a game. Now remember ladies and gentlemen, we here at Spiffco don't believe in slaves. We think it's a terrible way to treat a human being and we 100% do not support any of the acts shown in this video. Indentured servitude workforces however, oh now that's a different matter. Are you an unpaid intern? How would you like to be paid even less? Then sign up to work at Spiffco today. We'll take anyone. Warning, interns at Spiffco are expected to of course offer up their firstborn child as donation and sacrifice to Spivco. If Spivco is further closed down due to either bankruptcy or the catastrophic collapse of the entire solar system caused by accidental experimental scientific tea research, then it is your solemn duty to restart the business and revive Overlord Supreme Marshal of the Skies and almost everything, Sir Spiff. Upon doing so, you'll be ranked up and your wage will be increased by up to 0.1p per hour. Aren't we generous? Alright, bam. We're in the game. It's fantastic. So we're playing as the evil Nagaron faction. We are genuinely about as evil as you can get. We're at war with quite a few people indeed. We're at war with Hag Grief to our south and naturally we'll probably just go down there and invade them. But as you will notice, this is a absolutely ridiculously large map. We can actually capture all of this if we wanted to. We could go all the way from over here to right the way over here and then just start colonizing everything and putting our fantastic work population to good use. However, instead of doing that, ladies and gentlemen, instead we're just going to be completely and utterly cheesing the game. Now our first opening move is just simply going to be going down to the south and actually attacking all of these people. But now is actually probably the best time 
time to demonstrate why I chose to play Mortal Empires and not the Eye of the Vortex campaign. You see, when it comes to actually creating slaves, slaves are calculated on a provincial basis. The more cities you control in a province, the more slaves you can put in that province. Now, each province can have a max total, and if you fill up to that 100% total, you lose 8% of your slaves per turn. But of course, if that total is higher, you can make more money. But another way of looking at it is if we have 500 slaves in a province which can store 16,000 slaves, we won't lose any slaves. But if we have 500 slaves in a province which can only store a thousand, you're going to be losing a couple of percentage of slaves per turn. Also, provinces with four cities or even five cities allow you to stack the bonuses which come with slaves, meaning you generate even more money. So basically, we're going to be just trying to grab all of these fantastic provinces which have four massive cities in them. The end of our first turn is rather simple. Just recruit a load of units and ever so slightly upgrade our cities. Now, you might be wondering why we actually even want money. Well, you see, money is quite possibly one of the most important resources in this game. Money allows you to have more lords, more armies, everything. If you have any problems in this game, it can just be solved by money. You have too many enemy armies which are too high tech and you can't defeat them, throw two armies at it and suddenly you've won instantly. And for some reason, the best way of making money is, of course, slaves. I mean, they're absolutely fantastic, so that's exactly what we're going to be using them for. Anyway, we've made our way over to the Temple of Cain, and instead of colonizing it or doing nothing, I'm going to actually search it, as hopefully we can get a free bit of goodies here. Oh god, it's puzzle time! <laughs> oh no! Time to do some calculations. Okay, bam, I've done it. Basically, it's a Sudoku. It's blue one. Puzzle failed! I'm a melon. I'm an absolute melon. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> In fact, I was just like, bam, I've got it. No, no, you haven't. <laughs> You really haven't. Sometimes confidence is not the correct way to go about things. My goodness. Now, money in this game is actually quite a bit of a tricky thing, especially for some factions. If you're playing Skaven, then you might as well just wave goodbye to any money slash food because the game just decides you don't need any. Anyway, bam, we're going to have to sadly colonize the Temple of Cain because uh, I decided to beans up the, um, the magic puzzle, but hey, that's my bad. Anyway, Nagrond, our capital city, can actually have an upgrade. Now, Nagrond is a fantastic city because we can build some great things in it we've got torture pits they're fantastic we can also like have some sorceresses and like hire some dragons eventually early turns are mostly just going to be sent like running our legendary lords around just sniping up a couple of cities it's going to actually take a while to get our fantastic slave economy up and running but once it is up and running oh god it really runs so our enemy has foolishly decided to march an army into our land so naturally we're just going to do our classic welcoming brigade and uh, just crush them i mean they're not even in our lands but we're gonna crush them anyway now the thing is the dark elves even though they sound like the big evil bad guy faction they're actually ridiculously defensive based i mean they're not bad when you try and like actually get them up close and fighting but all of their best bonuses are when you just have wave after wave of ridiculously overpowered range units sat behind a wall of spears so that's exactly what we're going to be doing we're just going to be sat behind a wall of spears whilst we hurl magic over the top of them and there we have it a relatively easy fight where i just sat in the corner of the map with my superior ranged and just wailed at them from a distance very tasty this is where you can definitely see where the balance of of the dark elves comes into play our spear infantry are literal chod they're useless they have high defense but their attacks are about as effective as them just waving a soggy pool noodle in front of them as far as i'm aware they're not even using real spears but hey at least they do have real shields as that allows our fantastic dark shard crossbow men to literally sit behind them and get almost 100 kills which is ridiculous that's much more than our artillery piece did, that's for certain. Ah, oh, well, bam We managed to level up, and of course, most importantly, we captured some enemy. Of course, you could just gain 100 experience for all units, which is uh, interesting. It's actually pretty useless, considering most of our meat shields are just going to die anyway, and our crossbows will level up over time, so don't waste time doing that. Equally, you don't need to ransom captives. Money isn't going to be an issue, but replenishing is definitely something we want to do, because more replenishment means we heal up faster. And we get some slaves for it. And slaves, well, that's just free money. Now for you, the lovely ladies and gentlemen at home, this video is actually only 
are going to be, what, like 20 to 30 minutes long? But for me, I'm actually going to be sat down for about eight hours playing Total War Warhammer 2. There's a lot of turns to get through. This game's quite slow. Once you're only on turn 10, we're already about 50 minutes into a recording session. Oh, God. I'm never going to stop recording. But nonetheless, we have our first set of slaves. Now, they are actually pretty wrongly distributed. We need to make sure that we are putting all of our slaves into the right place, and that would be Nagaron. So what we want to do is see that we have some slaves over here in the Black Flood and just quite simply say no more slaves. We don't want any more slaves going over there. Slaves in the Iron Mountains, however, we want to load. Now, the reason why is because there's 76 slaves in the Black Flood, making one. There's only an extra 15 or so in the Iron Mountains, and they're making 18 times that. And that should roughly explain to you why you want to position your slaves in fantastically creative, wacky ways. Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen. I'll survive recording this. I've got a nice warm cup of Yorkshire tea. Mmm. Drank today out of the fantastic and amazing Spiffco approved tea consumption container, or a mug, as uh, everyone else would call it. Right, you know what? I think it's each time. We're gonna take Hag Grave. It looks great. We got some spicy boys here. Let's do this. Ah, success! Another glorious siege battle. This one was a little bit risky, but as you can see, our fantastic meat shields did their job splendidly and successfully almost died without just quite losing everyone. Now, what we've just experienced was our first have a rebellion in our lands. Very exciting, and it was very good fun. And of course, because we've had our rebellion, bam, we get 75 slaves. Now, that's not a lot of slaves, but to be fair, I did kind of deliberately not give the rebellion time to muster. If you let the rebellion sit around for a while, the rebellion will basically just gain more and more men, mustering slowly over time. But yes, well, bam, 75 slaves, so we're now up to 459 slaves, which are going to start generating even more money. Oh, and also, it's colonizing time. That's right, we've now got three cities in the Black Flood region. But the fantastic thing is the actual Rebellion army isn't gone yet, so I get to have a second fight against them, which is going to be absolutely ridiculous. Oh yes. I mean, these battles, they're absolutely great fun. What you do is you just set your shields into like one corner of the map, put crossbowmen above them, and then just watch absolute chaos unfold. It's great. Lots of profits to be had, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, would you just look at this mountainous corner region we have over here? That's perfect. Perfect. And here we are, it's time for the Chaos Rebels to start running into our glorious firing line. Oh yes, it's perfectly balanced. <laughs> Good stuff indeed. It honestly wouldn't surprise me if they retreat very quickly, but you know, we're going to have some fun with them. Oh, look, they're already starting to retreat. Ah, there we go, glorious victory. Very easy indeed. And fantastic, that's another 30 slaves to be added to the fold. Glorious stuff indeed. Now it's very important when early on in the game to not focus a ridiculous quantity on slaves because in these early battles you're not going to be generating a lot your lords aren't actually going to be very skilled at collecting slaves I mean they're gonna be okay but if you take a look at some of the levels you can get you've got dreaded slaver which basically increases the amount of slaves you can capture at the end of the battles for example plus 25% that's very good indeed however you don't want to get those kind of stats on a regular lord like that you instead want to start using Malakef because Malakef can get the plus 25% from dreaded slaver but equally he can also get all of these fantastic bonuses up here, like Scoured and Stripped, which is plus 50% casualties captured post-battle. So if you play your cards correctly and actually manage to get multiple lords into each battle, you could theoretically capture a ridiculous quantity of slaves. And of course, if you don't want to capture slaves via there, well don't worry, you've got loads of research options as well. Like bam, plus 15% captured from after battles, so yeah, you can get plus 100% quite easily. Now this is how to properly do a battle, ladies and gentlemen. Take a ridiculous army of massive size with just a bunch of shieldy spear boys with pool noodles and a bunch of crossbow people and just wave assault them into a massive group of chaos warriors and capture not only 375 slaves but also a 19% unit replenishment which is ridiculous because that basically just means the army's up and running again. Now we've just won naturally yet another rebellion conflict. They're all good fun. They're great because I gain occasionally some magical artifacts from them. We lose occasionally only you know a handful of spears, but you know, they're spear boys, they're pretty easily replaceable, but we gain 252 slaves. Now what does 252 slaves do to our economy? Well, we're generating 1,596 gold per turn, we capture 256 slaves, and all of a sudden our economy is going to start going for a couple of extra changes. You see, up until a couple of turns ago, this region here, the Black Flood, which only has 249 slaves, as you can see, is generating 
1000. The Iron Mountain to have 700 slaves is just generating only 200 more than it. Meaning logically if we put more slaves into the Black Floods we're going to be generating a ridiculous quantity of wealth. Okay so I've just fought one of the uh, quest battles of this game. They're very challenging I must say. It was good fun. We did lose of course a ridiculous quantity of chump noodle boys. Um, yeah they uh, didn't actually hold up that well against massive great knights with holy weapons which produce flames and all that but um, otherwise the crossbow boys they did fantastic but yes with this quest actually completed we're going to be given a fantastic relic item which we're going to be able to use ourselves to make Malekith even more powerful in battles and also hopefully conquering because we could do some more lands you know to store willing workforce populations in that's right I'm going to use creative language skills to dodge the YouTube Autobot which is going to naturally massively catastrophically demonetize this video. But how can you stop the demonetization process? Well go down into the comment section and type happy words, nice words, and this video will for some reason be seen as being nice, I guess? <laughs> oh goodness. And hey, whilst you're down there, why not give the video a like? Because everyone who gives this video a like, congratulations. When you of course eventually turn into being a unpaid intern for the fantastic Spivco Corporation, those who like this video will be receiving a yearly company bonus. That's right, we'll be giving you one free used Yorkshire tea bag, ladies and gentlemen, used by company Supreme Marshal Spiff himself. I know. Keep it as an heirloom. Day two. Right, so welcome back anyway, ladies and gentlemen. It's turn 78. We're, this is actually an entire day after I started recording because I sat down, played for six hours, and then I kind of had a break, recorded with Hat Films, and now I'm sat back down again, and I've been playing for like the last two hours, just, you know, progressing the game a bit, but I think I've now hit the point where I'd like to show off what I've created. So we have 11,440 slaves, and we are currently turning a profit of around about 17,000 gold per turn which is very nice basically our total income per turn is about 26,000 however we're having to spend around about 8,000 per turn just keeping our armies up and running which honestly isn't actually too much but where is all the money coming from well it basically all comes from one entire province the Iron Mountains now the Iron Mountains is a very unique province it's where we have our most slaves if we see the Iron Mountains it has a slave capacity of 12,500 and we've managed to put 6,400 in there. So as you can see ladies and gentlemen we're generating 4,000 gold per turn just from having our slaves inside the Iron Mountains but that's not actually the best part. You see slaves don't just generate a basic income from sitting there. You see whilst we do have buildings like the slave market over here which gives us a base rate of 15 gold per turn per hundred slaves and the most important part is that slaves provide an increase to the actual amount of base money being made in the region. You see slaves over here are very important because these unpaid interns can effectively triple the actual amount of money each province is generating. As we can see, the actual income increase that just having 6,000 slaves in this one province has is a 97.4% increase to our income. So take a look at that. We're actually only meant to be earning around about 5,000, but thanks to the legendary slaves, we've basically doubled that. And we haven't even filled up this province yet, ladies and gentlemen. This province by itself is paying for all of our expenses in one go. If I was to lose all of my other lands I could still wield four practically full armies. Yes I know this game is very unique indeed and this isn't even theoretically the most optimal way of doing it. You see as slaves effectively multiply what they already have if you put the slaves in a region where a large amount of money is already being generated then lo and behold you're gonna generate even more money. So the perfect setup you're going to want for effectively all of your minor cities would be something along the lines of one building in a settlement which produces money and then a variation of either something which increases slave income or something which also increases slave income. Although if you're having issues with actually holding the province, just throw in a couple of torture posts and we'll ban public order is perfectly fine now. The Black Flood here is most likely going to become the most profitable province in the entirety of the known universe. So whilst Malekef is busy beating back all of the slaves to the south, we're actually having a fantastic time with our homelands just generating a ridiculous amount of money. And we haven't even kind of hit the most optimum point because because if we were to actually raise up another army and go take Caron's car with it, there's a building in here which actually decreases the amount of slaves decline rate and also increases the amount of money they produce. Anyway, we're gonna try and cheese this a little bit more and I'll get back to you even later, probably several hours down the line once even more unpaid interns have been collected. 
two hours later. Well, I've just auto-resolved one of the greatest battles I think has ever happened. Basically, the Skavens and Tretch Craven Tail himself, the most powerful of Skavens, got control of this settlement over here, and I thought, you know what, I might as well go attack it. Skavens are a great source of slaves because their units are just so plentiful in numbers. So even though the Skavens only deployed an army of 1,700 and I killed 800 of them, for some reason I managed to capture 1,636. Look, I don't quite know how the statistics are working out on this one, but thank you, Tretch Craven Tail, nonetheless. Your slaves are going to be fantastic. Oh, and of course, we can loot and occupy for another 1,700 slaves. I forgot about that. But yes, we're now at 12,000 slaves, and because we've increased from like 10,000 to 12,000 in one turn, our income has, of course, increased by about 3,000. Yeah, that's just kind of how the system works. And we still only have 45% slaves in this region. If anything, the number of slaves currently in Nagarond has gone down due to the fact that I haven't actually been spamming out a load of battles, although I do believe I have some way to kind of manipulate the system. I had some brand new technology researched as well, Daylight Denied, providing us with an extra 10% income from slaves and increased income from iron and gold mines, all very nice indeed. And great, would you just look at that auto-resolve? Auto-resolve? Are you seriously saying, no, there's absolutely no way you can win this one, I'm afraid, Spiff, it's positively impossible. Possible great, so I have to sit down and do this one myself. Fantastic game. It's the last thing I want for my Total War games, having to actually fight the battles. Honestly, that fight actually wasn't too bad. I just sat at the back of the map and let all of my range units just completely wail away and destroy the enemy before they even could touch me. Honestly, supreme perfect fighting style wins every time. See, the Dark Elves, or the Dork Elves as some people like to call them, or well, no, <laughs> they don't really have any units that are actually any good at fighting particularly. Their range units are decent, but I mean, they're kind of just like a slightly worse equivalent of the High Elves. But the one thing they do have on their side is unpaid interns willing to work in coal mines 24 hours a day, 7 days a week with no holidays. It's perfect. Right, bam, we're back. It's turn 98. Um, we've been having a nice, fun little slow campaign here in Total Warhammer 2. Some fantastic things have happened. Uh, we've managed to conquer up to the Broken Lands and, of course, up towards, like, the Sea of Chaos and all those evil places which you don't really want to hold. But we're actually starting to get into the perfect point in the game, the Slave Farm point. Now, what is a Slave Farm exactly? Well, it's relatively simple, ladies and gentlemen. You see, over here we have a set of lands, the Black Spine Mountains, I do believe. They're not exactly great. In fact, they're positive positively terrible. As you'll notice, because of the horrifically uninhabitable climate, we have a constant minus free public order to effectively each and every one of our settlements, which means that effectively a rebellion is guaranteed to always happen here constantly. There is physically no way to avoid this rebellion. Now, if you have a rebellion in a province where you have slaves, part of your slaves are involved in that rebellion, so consequently you lose slaves every time you have a rebellion. For that reason, you want to have your slave-heavy provinces be very happy. You want them to be the happy happiest places on earth. However, when it comes to provinces with none of your unpaid interns, it matters little. If anything, you want to incite as many rebellions as possible simply so that you can throw wave after wave of intern harvesting armies after them. And of course, one thing you can do is also buy a load of assassins who can sit in various regions and consequently increase the local slave income by 10%. This leads to some pretty wacky situations where, as you can see, we're generating a relatively crazy amount of money. And we haven't even hit our cap. As you can see, we have 8,750 out of a possible 17,500. It's a ridiculous amount of money we could be making to the point where we could actually be covering all of our costs from this one region alone. But of course, this isn't our only region. We now also have the Black Flood to pour loads of unpaid interns into and the Broken Lands, because the Broken Lands come with a special building called the Slave Traders Palaces. This is a very special building indeed, ladies and gentlemen, as it increases all profitability as well as decreasing the decline rate everywhere, basically just making this strategy all the more powerful. Now I'm going to be demonstrating our fantastical intern farming capabilities, as next turn a rebellion is going to be rising up. Isn't it great when you know where a rebellion's going to be, when it's going to spawn, all of that fantastic good stuff. But anyway, fantastic news, the rebellion has started, and consequently this means we can grab our army right here and just slam it into the rebellion, and wha-bam, it's time to fight a rebellion. For some reason, I'm actually going to have to fight this myself because 
because the game believes that seven groups of crossbow boys and five heavy spear infantry isn't enough to beat a couple of skelly bone boys who are literally rated as being meat shields with no good abilities but that's fine you know we'll, we'll fight them yeah the auto resolve system in this game is just completely and utterly broken just don't trust it now if you want to get technically more captives from the end of your battle you can just let the enemy army muster for a couple of turns but as my occupying force here isn't actually that large yet I'm going to sadly not be able to do that if it was the case though you theoretically could just have a absolutely massive army and then wait for the AI to amass a huge 20 stack themselves and then throw yourselves against them anyway let's have a quick fight and we're bam fantastic they rebelled and we get 254 slaves a fine addition so Certainly not the most efficient way of doing things, but it's a good one. And of course, when your lords level up, you can make them capture even more and more. If I was to actually be smart about this, I'd probably take Malekith himself over here and plonk him down, and he'd make a much more efficient capturing system of the whole affair. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this has been my brief array into Total War Warhammer 2, ladies and gentlemen. If you have indeed enjoyed your experience and want to try and show some support for the ridiculous amount of time we've put into this video, then feel free to give the video a like and hop down into the comment section and tell me which game you'd like to see next or if you have any other total war exploits of your own then feel free to give me a shout of course there are lots of fun little things you can do with the skelly boys when it comes to choosing their research tree and there's also the fact that the brand new skaven lord is completely overpowered and broken because he literally has a nuclear bomb anyway this game's fantastic and i absolutely love it as always a massive thank you to each and every one of our majestic patrons who make these fantastical videos all the more possible genuinely thank you very much i'm going to be trying to look into fun new things things to do with you guys in the new year. I'm hoping that maybe we can do a couple more community games. We'll see about it. Anyway, and of course, if you're wondering what video to watch next, look no further than this one advertised on screen now, hand chosen by myself to be absolutely perfect. And why not consider subscribing? Because you know, that way you just can't get rid of me. You can never get rid of me. I'm there always. I'm at your right, your left. You don't know. Anyway, I'll see each and every one of you in the next one. Have an absolutely lovely day and goodbye for now.